Yeah, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, family, colleagues, uh, and members of the uh, Defense Committee. Welcome to this academic session, which I formally open here. And uh, we defend the thesis called From Behavior to Brain, the Contribution of Rhythm to Auditory Perception by Miriam Heinkes. I kindly ask you to give us a nice summary of your great work. Thank you very much. Highly esteemed prorector, members of the opposition, dear family, friends, colleagues. Um, in the following, I would like to give you a summary of some of the findings that were part of the research conducted during my PhD um, for my PhD thesis entitled From Behavior to Brain, the Contribution of Rhythm to Auditory Perception. I would like to start by shortly looking at why we investigated acoustic rhythms and how, and then dive into the contents of chapter two and three, where we focus on behavioral findings, to then uh, follow up with chapter four, focusing on changes in the brain, and to then lastly arrive at our conclusions from these chapters. So my thesis is entitled The Contribution of Rhythm to Auditory Perception. And let's start by answering why acoustic rhythms are interesting to study. Hearing rhythm is useful because it allows the brain to predict when something um, is, is coming up and also to focus your attention and time to a specific moment. And how might this prediction be useful? Well, you can adjust your behavior accordingly. For instance, you are more sensitive to sounds at an expected moment in time, or you are able to respond faster to a sound. But, um, and this is the type of behavior research that we looked at in chapter two and three. You can also look at what happens when and where in the brain. And this is what chapter four is about. And today we'll focus on sensitivity as well as where changes in the brain occur. So we started by developing a task to test the behavior of participants when they listen to rhythms. And let's start with an example of the type of sounds and the task that we used. So I would like you to imagine a safe or a lock, and unfortunately you have forgotten the combination. And one way you might be able to open this lock again, it's a bit of a Hollywood scene, is that you would listen very carefully to the mechanics of this lock. And then there are wheels in it. And when these wheels line up and touch a locking bar, then um, that would allow it when it's perfectly aligned for the locking bar to slide and then this lock would open. And um, if you listen very closely, you might be able to pick up the sound when the wheels are in place and touch the bar. And we created such sounds that would sometimes have such a difference. And here in blue, you see a regular sound. And in red, you see a sound in which we embedded a temporal shift. And this temporal shift is what participants had to detect and then respond whether they heard or they did not hear the sound. And it's quite a challenging task. I'll let you try. So this is a regular sound. And this is the sound that contained the temporal shift. So quite difficult. And of course, we did not present these sounds alone, but we embedded them in a rhythm to see what the effect of this rhythm would be. And in various experiments in chapter two and three, we used these types of regular sequences but also compared it to irregular sequences as well as a temporal cue condition. And these latter two are um, helpful because they, uh, they help us understand how rhythms in the environment may be useful for the brain. And the idea is that it's more difficult for the brain to follow along an irregular sequence than it is to follow along a regular sequence. And the temporal cue also tells you when something will happen like a regular um, sequence, but it does not have the regular repetition before. So taken together, it's useful to compare regular sequences to irregular sequences and the cue, as the behavior in response to them can then tell us something about the underlying mechanisms. So with this task design, we then set out to address a few open questions. First, we asked whether there is a preferred rhythm at which we would be more sensitive to detecting a target. And we looked at different rhythms and had the idea that a rhythm in the middle of this range 
would be better than very slow or very fast rhythms, as the rhythms in the middle are relevant for speech processing, and the brain is very sensitive, or the auditory cortex is very sensitive to speech. And to our surprise, this is actually not what we found, but um, we observed that participants were most sensitive at slow rhythms, and then they showed a decreasing sensitivity at faster rhythms. And this preference for slow rhythms may be driven by the motor system, as it has been shown that both passive rhythm perception and more active rhythm production are closely linked in the brain. And um, these slower rhythms are very typical in the motor system. So different rhythms were not the only thing that we investigated, but we also looked into different carrier frequencies because we know that humans have preferences for certain frequencies. So the perceived tone height or pitch of a sound. For instance, we are more sensitive to frequencies that are in the range of human voices. And um, we wanted to check if the carrier frequency of a sound sequence has an effect when we present these rhythms to our participants. So we presented low, medium, and high sound sequences. And we found that participants were most sensitive to detect targets and rhythms that had a low carrier frequency and less sensitive with increasing carrier frequency. And this study informed us that for future studies, um, we would then need to take this carrier effect into account if we wanted to compare different um, high and low sounds for, by adjusting the task difficulty. And then lastly, we were interested in comparing the before mentioned different temporal structures. So in our last set of experiment, we compared regular rhythms to irregular rhythms in the temporal cue. And here's what we found. We saw that both a regular rhythm and the cue help to improve sensitivity compared to an irregular rhythm. And this was a bit surprising to us because we had hypothesized that the regular rhythm would help even more than the cue because it repeats over time. And then what we did was we followed up on this and asked, okay, what happens now if we instruct our participants to rely more on the rhythm? And then lo and behold, with instruction, participants could use this rhythm further and improve their sensitivity compared to the cue. And the irregular rhythm always remained the most difficult condition. And this showed us something important, namely that a rhythm does not automatically lead to an approved sensitivity relative to a temporal cue. But with instruction, it allowed us to, or it allowed our participants to focus their attention and time and thereby increase sensitivity. So far, we focused on behavior. Now we'd like to make a switch and actually look at what happens in the brain. And for this, we used high field functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. And it's called functional MRI because we can not only make or get good pictures of the brain as we can do with MRI, but we can also record changes in the brain. Um, you can see these colored activation blobs here. And this is possible because the brain requires oxygen when it is active, and we can measure the change in oxygenated blood within a given area. And why do we call it high field fMRI? Well, here in Maastricht, we have one of a few scanners with very high magnetic field of seven Tesla. And um, this allows us to not only inspect activation changes in a certain area of the brain, but we can actually zoom into the brain and into the gray matter of the cortex of living humans and then inspect activation changes across the cortical depth. And this is so-called layer fMRI. And beyond a strong magnetic field, you also need specialized hardware and specialized processing software to um, do this kind of research. And uh, there are only a handful of groups worldwide where this type of research can be done. So what did we then investigate with this method? I would like you to think back of the log that we are trying to open in the beginning and um, by listening to the mechanics of the slot. So I would like you to imagine that you are slowly turning the wheels and that these notches align. And when they do, they will make a subtle click sound. And when the sound reaches your ear, this is what we refer to as feed forward input and or any sound that reaches the ear. And it travels via the auditory nerves to different brain areas. For instance, the primary auditory cortex the first area in the cortex where sounds being processed. And um, when the input arrives here, it arrives in the middle of the gray matter. At the same time, you're also listening very closely to the sound and you're attending to it. And this attention in the, um, in the brain has been shown to be feedback from higher areas arriving in the upper depth of the primary auditory cortex. 
So how come then that despite attending very closely and this click being there physically in the sound, you might still not be able to open the lock and hear the sound? And um, this is sort of the question that we uh, addressed. And we had the idea that it would be due to very small differences in the attentional feedback that arrives in the uh, upper layers of the primary auditory cortex. And uh, this is what we then tested in our study, whether detection leads to an increase in activation in the superficial depth. So how did we investigate this? Our participants listened to high and low pitched regular rhythms while we recorded changes in their brain. And as before, they needed to respond whether they heard or did not hear a target in the rhythm. And afterwards, we could then compare the brain activation uh, when they did hear this target compared to when they did not hear it. And this was not a trivial job because the difficulty of this task needed to be exactly right, such that there were an equal number of detected and undetected targets for a participant. So we had to, for instance, make this task a little bit more difficult when low sounds were presented, because we saw earlier that um, participants are more sensitive or we are more sensitive at low um, carrier sounds. And in the next step, we then presented sounds of many different frequencies in a so-called, that ranged from high to low frequencies in a so-called localizer. And with this localizer, uh, we, um, so we asked our participants to just lie there and listen to these sounds. And we would get a map of the, where the auditory regions in the brain are. So here you can see an inflated hemisphere so that we also get a good view in the grooves of the brain. Um, and the different colors refer to the frequency preference of this region. So a red colored area is um, a region that prefers low frequency sounds and a blue colored area, high frequency sounds. So, and in these regions, we then looked in the cortical depth and compared the activation to detected and undetected targets. And what did we find? As we hypothesized, we saw that in the upper depth associated with feedback from other brain areas, a larger response for detected and undetected targets. And that this was in line with our idea that attention feedback can be seen in an, early, in an area as early as the primary auditory cortex. And um, it codes for whether we heard something or not. Then in a follow-up analysis, we tested whether this detection effect that we observed was frequency specific. So we had this map of frequency preference and we could inspect low and high frequency preferring regions separately. And if this attention feedback would be very specific, then it could be that we see this increase for detected trials only for the high frequency sounds that were presented, but they're not when low frequency sounds were presented because um, this region does not prefer these sounds. Um, however, this is not what we saw. We saw a more general effect. Um, and similar, this would apply to the low frequency preferring regions, such that it might be the case that it's only for low um, sounds and there would not be um, a difference for high sounds. But again, um, uh, we saw this effect uh, for both sounds and both types of regions. So then I would already like to come to our conclusions. In these past 15 minutes, I um, showed you, or we saw that slow and low rhythms allowed participants to be most sensitive to uh, detecting changes in sound. We also saw that a rhythm and a temporal cue both help in det better detecting a target, but with instruction, one can use the rhythm to be even more sensitive. And lastly, we saw that larger attention feedback to the upper depth of the primary auditory cortex influences detection. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and give the word back to the pro-rector. Yeah, with an amazing timing. So I think you have 30 seconds left or something. <laughs> great. Also very great summary of your work. Thanks a lot. I would like to open the opposition now by asking uh, the chair of the reading committee, Professor Kotz, expert in neuropsychology and translational cognitive neuroscience of Masters University. Don. Dear candidate, uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to read this incredible piece of work. Uh, um, it's differentiated, it's reflected, uh, and the thoughts that have gone into running these experiments are quite impressive. So my congratulations to that, and certainly also congratulations to the supervisory team for uh, keeping Miriam on track. <laughs> 
of course, there are always questions. And um, one of the questions that struck me is um, the fact that um, temporal associations act exactly the same way as rhythmic processing. Um, <clears throat> so um, you subsume this as, as a potential um, insight into one form of temporal prediction. Um, would you still think that there is differentiation? I mean, you see a task effect, for example, uh, you see ultimately differences uh, of a continued sequence relative to two elements that, that are cued. Uh, do you think, uh, mechanistically speaking, there could still be differences if you had done an MRI study? And if yes, what would they look like? Mm -hmm. Highly esteemed opponent. Thank you for your compliments and for your question. Um, that's of course the uh, what we would like to get at with good psychophysics, right? To that it tells us something about the underlying neural mechanism, and um, despite not looking into the brain. And in the first um, experiment uh, where we compared uh, temporal associations or this temporal cue, as I called it to the rhythm, we saw that there was no difference in terms of sensitivity. So if you would just look at that the size of the behavioral effect is the same, it might be so quick to assume that, oh, it's very likely the same on a line neural mechanism. But um, from other research, we actually know that it's likely two mechanisms. I also think that's two different areas in the brain um, where it's possible that, for instance, the rhythm is more driven by a subcortical basal ganglia circuit and then more te temporal associations have been associated with cerebellar circuits and that these are then the, let's say, the origin of predictions that would be forwarded to the um, primary auditory mm -hmm. cortex. And if we were to do an fMRI experiment and target these regions, then uh, yeah, I think that would be the thing to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, if I throw attention into the equation, yeah. uh, where would the difference arise between these two phenomena? Um, well, we saw now directing attention. And so I think attention can influence both and have an effect on both circuits or interact with both circuits, um, probably in, in different, differentiated ways. Um, but we saw that focusing attention specifically on the rhythm can improve uh, performance relative to the cue. And I, so I was thinking if you were to have a condition in which you specifically then ask participants to direct attention on the cue, would this also improve, uh, let's say the other way around. Mm -hmm. But my reasoning was that attention is already more localized, let's say on the cue, because there is only one element before that cues you. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. Does, does that? Uh, it does yeah. make sense, but there there mm -hmm. is some evidence that focusing on the cue uh, in a particular attentive way will make a difference. Mm -hmm. these, these are classical studies by Nobe and colleagues, mm -hmm. uh, in particular also with regards to temporal prediction. So, mm -hmm. and there is a big discussion: Are we talking about the same form of prediction mm -hmm. as when we generate predictions? in a continued uh, manner, right? Where it's more emergent relative to being targeted in a sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah uh, some room for thought. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm also wanting to, to focus a little bit on, on chapter four, where, where you very nicely differentiate um, in these layers, the feed forward and the feedback. Um, um, ideas. And of course, this is something that has also been related to prediction in general and predictive coding in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and um, of course, at the moment, your focus is very much on the auditory cortex. But given what you just said mm -hmm. before, uh, these, these other systems in the brain that are very temporally sensitive, they may even be attentive or sub, sub attentive in a sense. Mm -hmm. Would you speculate that beyond what you see at the moment at the cortical level, uh, that this would also involve the subcortical level? And would it look exactly like that in a layer specific manner? <laughs> so you're asking me um, 
I mean, two questions, whether, yeah. <laughs> so whether subcortical areas are involved yeah. and then linking it to the layers, could we, so could we investigate subcortical areas with layer fMRI or can we easily, mm -hmm. yeah, do something similar to what we did? There may be other dimensionalities that are yeah. important. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting question. And it's, of course, most of the um, layer studies that have been conducted so far focus on the primary sensory regions, whether it's primary auditory cortex or visual cortex, um, because it is, um, you, you need a good, you need to know where you are in, from this, let's say, across the cortical depth, where do we say that the middle is, where do we say that the upper and lower um, depth bins are and um, this could compare in this to histology for instance then we just know most um, like our model is best in these areas mm -hmm. and so this uh, on the one hand and um, I think that imaging subcortical structures in general is more difficult because you have less signal there and then um, so it's I yeah I think it's very interesting to, uh, to link this to for instance, see whether mm, see whether these regions can be the source of the prediction of what we see here as a sort of as the feedback. Um, whether we could um, have a, a laminar depth result of the basal ganglia, for instance, I this would be I I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and um, yeah, so it would be interesting to see if these regions are the origin of the predictions and then combine it with this research I've done here. Thanks very much. I hand back to the director. Thank you very much, Sonia. I pass on the word now to Professor Isa Yacoub, uh, Center for Magnetic Resonance Research uh, at the University of Minnesota. Isa, thanks for being with us online uh, and um, we are looking forward to your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, wonderful talk. Um, I just had a, a couple of questions. One um, uh, regarding the, the laminar fMRI um, where you uh, used frequency, I think frequency preference um, and looked at the relationship uh, with that. And, and my question is, uh, you know, given you were talking about feed forward and feed backward and, and there's a depth dependence uh, expectation with that, um, if you considered whether there were any biases uh, in the fMRI signal, given that you're using gradient echo and given some of the previous publications um, from uh, other investigators, uh, you know, that were here and also in Maastricht were showing that there were some bias in the frequency preference and how that um, might impact, uh, you know, your findings. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much um, for your compliment and for your question. And uh, it's a, yes, it's an interesting question. And we know that uh, gradient echo bolt, so the um, acquisition that we used for this study has a strong bias of the draining range towards the surface. So there is um, on the surface a stronger signal. And given, so to link this bias or to, um, in fr the frequency preference that we have also used here and how far this impacts our results. Um, so for instance, previous work done by my supervisor, Federico Cudi Martino has shown that you can see columnarity across, so frequency preference across the depth. And we thought about, uh, well, we also looked shortly into this columnarity, but for instance, we did not impose this um, uh, on the data as this would limit, like we've, we did see columnarity and frequency preference across the entire depth, but did not use this. Um, so in that sense, that uh, is a, a bias that you could say is related to the frequency. Um, and we, of course, then did saw a stronger signal on the surface. And what we did do is the frequency preference was selected for each depth, uh, so separately. So it could be that because there's not a columnar frequency preference that what you see is um, different in, across the different layers. Um, however, I do not think that this was impact. 
the findings um, because it was present and yeah, it, it was present in everywhere. So it's not that we found it only in the subpopulation. So it can have an effect, of course. Yes. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Um, so the other question I had um, was you mentioned in your thesis that um, your preference was for um, using the gapped approach uh, uh, for the fMRI. And um, as you probably know, um, there is, you know, and, and you gave reasons for that, there's been more of a preference lately to do more continuous type um, auditory presentations during fMRI. And, and so I'm wondering if you've reconsidered, um, you know, at least what you've written in the thesis regarding um, that being more optimal or less optimal. Sorry, I did not hear the first part. The, you're referring to why we use the sparse acquisition. Well, I, I'm referring um, to a comment you had in your thesis about the gapped approach being um, the preferred approach uh, to play the sounds in the absence of gradients. Um, and I'm wondering if, if, if that's still the case or if you, you know, reconsidered given some re more recent data. Yeah. Um, I would, knowing what I know now, I would still do it the same way because we presented uh, rhythms of um, carrier frequency bandwidth that were quite similar to the uh, noise of the scanner itself. And if we were to present, so given these types of stimuli, it I would imagine it still to be difficult um, if you wanted to present them on top of the scanner noise. And this is why we went for this. Uh, gapped approach. And we also, um, so we piloted different versions. And in the beginning, we had a very long TR. And in the end, we already shortened the stimuli to two seconds. So we could acquire more data points per sound that we presented um, by having then multiple uh, volumes follow before the next uh, sound will be presented. But yes, I would do it uh, in the same way. Thank you. Do you have um, other questions or can I uh, pass on to the next? You can pass on. Asking? Can pass. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, the word is now uh, Professor Christopher Petkoff, expert in comparative neuropsychology of the Bioscience Institute of the Faculty of Medical Science at Newcastle University. Mm -hmm. Christopher, welcome and thanks for um, presenting your questions. Thank you, Professor, and uh, greetings, candidate. Um, I also uh, want to echo you know, some of the compliments that were made uh, by uh, Professor Kotz and uh, uh, Jakub. It was a delight to, to read the piece. It really was. It's a wonderful body of work. And I also wanted to comment that the, the translation of uh, Heschel's work on the temporal transverse charts was really well received because that, that work for many of us has been yeah, if, if we're not good with the language, it's just been out of reach. So it was wonderful to read. Um, and then, of course, all the, the chapters, the, the behavioral chapters um, and the, the laminar from my work, um, who I thought were uh, simply outstanding. Um, so the, the question, uh, so I've got two questions. One would be related to the behavior and one would be related to the laminar fMRI. And so maybe I could start off with um, um, the, the first question on the, on the behavior. And you, you very nicely clearly presented um, the fact that uh, when you were asking what would be the preferred rhythm for detecting you know, this temporal shift in your sounds, uh, it was maybe surprising or not to you, um, a lower frequency uh, effect, uh, which seems to fit nicely with um, you know, what some individuals have noted as you know, sort of the, the low frequency theta rhythms that might be there in the syllabic rated speech that seems to be also sort of a preferred sensitive range for, for detecting speech. And then you also clearly uh, highlighted that uh, low carriers also led to uh, higher sensitivity for that. Uh, what struck me was um, the fact that when, you know, as you so, showed nicely, you can improve perception when you give guidance on where that uh, target sound would be. But I got the impression that you were a bit surprised by the effects maybe not being as strong as you thought that they might be. Um, could you comment a little bit more on um, whether you thought that that could be improved and whether you did, because I don't remember uh, some training on the irregular rhythms and whether that would be improved or if not, what you might expect with that. 
highly esteemed opponent. Thank you for your compliments and for your question. And uh, yes, so you referred to the results of the different uh, psychoacoustic experiments and um, wondering whether I was surprised by the uh, by the size of the effect that when you were using attention, so in the attentional um, experiment, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I was not per se surprised by the size of the effect. I had just, uh, we went into the first experiment thinking that when you are presenting a regular rhythm compared to a temporal cue, just by the fact that you have um, a preceding rhythm, this would create a stronger prediction and therefore you would behaviorally be uh, more sensitive compared to the cue, um, given that there is a equal um, equal probability of that the target occurs in both cases. And this is not what we found. So then there was no difference and I was surprised by this mostly. And I did well, we had the hypothesis then if you were to direct attention of participants more strongly towards a certain position in the rhythm and they were making it um, more comparable to the cue, let's say, and then this would uh, further improve sensitivity. And this is in the end what we then also saw. Um, but I was not surprised by the size of the effect that we saw there. And it's actually, it's quite a weak effect. Um, yeah. Did you, um, yeah, the follow on to that was, uh, did you try improving uh, detection in the irregular rhythms? I didn't think that you did. Uh, was, was that the case? So, oh, true. The, um, so the instruction was done in such a way that we said, look, there are these uh, sequences and you have a higher chance of detecting a target embedded in the sequence at the 10th position. So that was the direct instruction. And um, so of course the irregular rhythm was also a sequence and also there it was the case. And what we actually saw is that um, if you look at the figure that uh, the irregular, the performance uh, D prime decreased for these, for some of the participants even, so that the magnitude of the effect between regular and irregular becomes a bit more enhanced. And my idea was that it could be that some um, participants were trying to use the same instruction on the irregular sequence, and then it was actually more difficult to do this. Um, because it's very difficult to count along with something that is not regular in time. Yeah, that's a very clear answer. Um, and, and just to finish off on the on the behavioral side of things, I really thought your comments about um, you know sort of the act of sensing attention being something that could help to improve perception of sounds in in, in the world is very important for conditions like you know folks with cochlear implants or other uh, auditory and communicative disorders where there's really importance to, you know, to, to be inspired by the results that you found. Uh, so on that point, what do you think could be inspiring for, you know, work with patients uh, with regards to how you can improve this process? Would you say that it, you know, the improvement should focus on, uh, you know, helping individuals to attend to things in the environment? Should sounds be optimized to have these low frequency components. What are your thoughts on that? Um, so th there was a bit of a uh, lag, so I'll, I'll try to summarize your question. So um, when looking at working with patients or improving, uh, for instance, um, the hearing of um, people that require cochlear implants, um, what should we focus on in this type of research? Is that, this was your question? That's correct, yes, yes. Um, yeah, I, so I think if you are exposed to many different sounds from the environment, um, of course, focusing on the rhythm, um, yes, I think it's good if you, if these cochlear implants or in general, the, the technology would help um, people that would require them uh, if you could focus your attention better to filter out uh, sources from, from a soundscape, yes. Thank you very much. And I'll move on to the second part um, on the laminar fMRI, which I thought was really uh, intriguing. Um, so my question is, uh, you showed quite compellingly that in um, around Heschel's gyrus, I guess it would be areas around primary auditory cortex or such, um, you're seeing that um, the sounds themselves are 
having stronger effects in the, the middle layers as a feed forward signal. And you highlighted in your presentation really quite clearly that uh, you know when uh, folks are detecting the sounds that there's uh, stronger activity in the superficial layers. Do you think that fits in nicely with theories of what you might expect in terms of feed forward and feedback laminar information flow um, in, in the literature? Things like, for example, the predictive coding framework or the canonical microcircuits model? Yeah, um, I do think that our study fits well within um, the framework of what previous studies have shown, um, where, for instance, the one of the first uh, studies in uh, layer fMRI also showed uh, perceptual, let's say, a perceptual effect of, so it was not the physical representation of a visual stimulus in that case, but um, a perceptual effect that was also more localized in, in this case, deep and superficial layers. And um, other work has also shown that attention effects as how we are describing our effect, what we see here, this detection effect, so effects of attention have been shown in superficial layers uh, in humans uh, using layer fMRI, but also, for instance, in uh, non-human primate work. Yeah. So in that sense, it does fit well with previous findings. And of course, the canonical microcircuit is more complex, the feed forward and feedback structure. But I think we can approximate this at this point, given what we can do with layer fMRI. Yeah, I agree. I think it really um, uh, you know, uh, complements some of the work that um, has been seen with uh, with animal models, not just primates. Um, and it's just beautiful to be able to see things like this um, you know, with uh, laminar fMRI. And as you say, it fits in nicely with some of the other previous work that um, uh, you folks in Maastricht have been uh, pioneering, uh, as well as some other groups uh, have been seeing. But uh, the other thing that I found interesting um, was that in non-primary auditory cortex, you were saying um, something a little different. Uh, was that not the case? So uh, if I remember correctly, it was the middle layers that were receiving input during what you might expect as a detection, the feedback process. Was that, uh, was that correct, my understanding? And, and do you think that that also fits within um, these, these models? Yeah, so we actually did not see uh, an effect of uh, depth in non-primary areas. So what we saw was a response to the sounds, um, a response to detected and undetected, as well as the no target sounds. But um, there was no difference across uh, different depth bands. Yeah. So and um, yeah, in this sense, it can be that where the information is forwarded from the primary auditory cortex to these um, non-primary areas and then uh, travels through the, the information is processed in, in the entire cortical column. Of course, we don't have the temporal resolution to then uh, investigate this, but uh, so that you would see a response and then it's not differentiated across steps anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you. Those are, um, yeah. I think my time is up. And the, the final thing I wanted to say was just my, my regrets right. for not being there with you. Thank you very much. Chris, thanks a lot. And sorry that I have to interrupt, but unfortunately your time is up and I have, we have to move on. Uh, thanks a lot for this nice uh, questions. Next one in line is Dr. Zulfikar uh, from the Department of Cognitive Neuroscience of Masters University. Isma, thanks for being there. Dear candidate, first of all, congr congratulations on this beautiful and very informative presentation. And of course, for a very well-written and interesting thesis. I particularly enjoyed your translation of Eshel's original manuscript as well. Um, so I would like to start uh, some questions about your chapter two in the thesis and uh, in the experiment one specifically. Uh, you report that the listener's performance in your results has a pre preference for slowest rhythm, that's the one hertz. And then you argue that these findings may be caused by the fact that your stimuli are closer to music and uh, then, then they are to speech. So in retrospect, how would you alter the experimental design to make it closer to speech? Esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and for your question. Uh, yeah, that's very interesting to think about um, how you could make these stimuli. I, 
closer to speech stimuli. I mean, um, they do, and you can see it here on the screen a little bit. So they were composed of five sounds that were already um, repeating at a 50 hertz rate and then grouped into these lower, so we called them quintets in the paper, and repeating at these lower rhythms. And with this, this was my uh, idea of approaching a sort of very simple hierarchy and makes it a bit more speech-like. Because speech, of course, also has these high frequency components and the slower envelope. Um, and um, yeah, it would be interesting if we wanted really to go more into the speech direction to, for instance, use um, uh, not these types of stimuli, but uh, syllables, for instance, or really actually use speech stimuli. Um, something else that I would like to do now in retrospect is to include an even slower rhythm at maybe 0 0.5 hertz to then see, because now it's a linear effect, but would it actually then drop? Is, it, is this truly a peak there or uh, would we then see, a, like, is it just if you have more time and if it's even slower, then uh, you would still improve your performance. So that would be something I would also like to do, which is not necessarily more speech-like, but uh, yes. So then uh, in continuation with that, uh, then you also had this uh, reduced sensitivity with increasing frequencies. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned going lower. If you go for higher modulation rates, do you think this uh, effect would persist? So you would you still see this reduced uh, sensitivity when you have higher frequencies in there, but with also with higher uh, modulation rates now? Mm. Um, yeah. It's it would be interesting to see. I would expect that, so the problem is we, it was physically the way we designed the sounds not possible to go to even faster presentation rates um, because these um, sounds have a length. So these five quintet sounds have a length of 100 or of 90 milliseconds. And then if you go much faster, so now you're at eight Hertz, which is very close, but if you then go faster then they would just start overlapping. So um, we would have to design, let's say, different sounds if we wanted to investigate higher presentation rates. Yeah. And um, I would expect, so, yeah, I, I would expect that the peak is actually in this low range. No, from other studies that looked at the amplitude, like the amplitude modulation where humans are most sensitive um, is typical in this lower range and uh, not at uh, higher frequency ranges. Thank you very much for your answers. I now give the word back to Corrector. Thank you very much, Dr. Zulfika. I pass on the word now to Dr. Lars Hausfeld, again, uh, expert in cognitive neuroscience from the Maastricht University. Lars. Yeah, uh, thanks, Corrector. Um, yeah, um, um, dear opponent, or yeah, uh, dear candidate. Um, yeah, first of all, congratulations to your thesis. Uh, very nice, a super thorough uh, behavior. What I want to uh, mention also is that I think it's the first time that I saw something haptic on the uh, on, on the thesis, which was uh, nicely fitting regarding what you were doing. Um, yeah, um, having said that you have done very thorough behavior, I want to um, take this uh, to the FMI chapter that you were doing, um, namely, um, uh, that um, in the um, uh, FMI chapter, you were presenting uh, quintets again. I think these were, that was a two hertz rhythm. And uh, compared to what you had before, where you showed a lot of effects regarding carrier, regarding rhythm, regarding instruction, um, you are uh, ending up with an understandably more simplistic scenario, right? Um, so my question would be, what would you like, I mean, would you like to go deeper into what you have found in the behavior uh, in the behavior papers that you were doing, and if so, which of these effects would you like to do? And is this possible, maybe in the MRI, or is maybe MRI then uh, maybe not the most ideal uh, method to, to look into that? Highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your compliments and for your question. Um, yes, we did, of course, uh, uh, multiple different experiments in the behavior, and then use the parameters that we identified there, sort of some optim we optimized the stimuli that we would then use in the scanner. So in the very beginning of my PhD, we actually had the idea that we could present 
um, multiple different rates and then compare the effect of these. However, it's um, of course, the more stimuli present, the more the stronger your response would also get. So it's not trivial to compare these um, in, in the scanner. And we therefore decided in the end then also for one type of rhythmic stimulus and uh, investigate this. And what I would like to do is if I were to follow up on this research now is to compare or what I find most interesting is to compare this um, rhythm to the cue and then a bit to what we were saying earlier to the origin of the predictions um, or where does this attention come from and then um, I don't know, maybe place the slab in such a way that you can include other areas and um, see the where this feedback might uh, be driven from. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, then a small uh, follow up on that. Um, so you found um, uh, when you were comparing the activation that you had for, for hits and misses, basically that is what we're doing a bit in this framework of awareness related negativity and so on. Um, um, so would you expect um, this to be different um, if this wouldn't have been a periodic queue, for example, um, but, but something like the temporal queue? Um, so that goes a bit into the question that Professor Kurz was asking before, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, another small follow-up there for false alarms, if you would have some, would you see the same thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so regarding your the first question, um, so we were presenting, of course, rhythms and then looking at detected and undetected or hits and misses um, within uh, these rhythms. And if we were to just look at a cue, whether we would see the same effect or whether this is driven by the rhythm, then in, like whether the rhythm contributes, right? Um, yeah, so this would, uh, I can only speculate at this point, and this would, of course, be then interesting to follow up on to see um, whether having the target be embedded in the rhythm is what drives the effect that we see when you then detect it, or whether it's the, let's say, detection per se, that if you have a cue, or maybe not even a cue, but just um, whether something is present or not present, whether we would see the same detection effect, that would be interesting to look mm -hmm. at. And um, your second question. False alarms. Ah, exactly. Um, yes, so if we had um, more false alarms or more, um, um, uh, non-targets uh, non uh, in general in this design it would be interesting to, to look into these. Um, unfortunately, you have to make certain choices um, and we wanted to optimize the design such that we get as many um, uh, sounds that had a target in them. And therefore the number of, of sounds that do not have a target is already only, uh, it's a quarter in comparison. And then of these ones, there were almost none that had, like you were saying, that were perceived as a false alarm. But if it was the case that we could have a, a perfect design where we have a lot of non-targets also, mm -hmm. and then there were also false alarms, I would expect to see this because perceptually the participant heard it. So I would expect to see that the effect would look as we saw here for the detection that it would be increased. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, um, do we have time for one more? Okay. Um, then um, I will ask about something that you did measure and no, uh, no longer about speculation there. Um, so when you looked at the individual subjects, which I very much appreciate, also the whole open science um, uh, framework that you were using here and, and making everything publicly available, great. Um, so um, you're presenting the single subject results and uh, I think the subject which had the highest number of trials was subject eight. And this subject did not show the feedback in, in primary auditory cortex, but showed and um, showed a difference in the in the um, middle to lower part. Uh, that I think was in I don't know supplementary material somewhere. Yes. So page hundred and thirty. Sorry. Yeah. Page hundred and thirty. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what do you say? Um, that with this lamina MRI, we or fMRI, we are at the SNR level that we can really make um, uh, that we can really say something about the individual, um, or whether we basically this should be considered as noise, and uh, whether we uh, uh, should look at the group level here. Because I mean, it's interesting. It's the one that seemingly has the highest power because you presented the most trials there, but the effect is basically different. Mm -hmm. um... 
Yeah, it's of course um, in an ideal scenario, you can have if you want to have a group analysis, then you have a, a large as group as possible, and. Um, as you are familiar with, it's a uh, very uh, time consuming to um, acquire these data and then analyze them. So in total, we have um, the data of 10 participants for this study. And um, while we see an effect, not always in the direction that, uh, as, you, as you're pointing out, not always in the same direction, we do see an effect in every single participant. And I do think that um, task fMRI does have strong effects that you can that are very constant also in across participants and that you can look at them in the individual mm -hmm. um, and then average or look at the do the statistical analysis on the group in the end um, mm -hmm. yes okay that means if I understood you correctly that means um, that this participant probably did somehow something different as compared to the others. I mean, the, the <laughs> it's a, yeah, there is noise involved. And ideally, if you have more participants, <laughs> then this noise will average out. Yes. So it's not that okay. this participant had a different, yeah, was doing something else. So yes, there is for sure also noise. Um, and you try to limit that by having more participants. Um, yeah, but yeah. I mean, just to sorry to interrupt, but I mean, mm -hmm. if if you would have the power, right, it would be interesting to see whether there are certain uh, hearing deficits, and then to basically point out towards at which level these are, and maybe they, you know, some people that show different profiles in terms of uh, layer specific processing might be affected differently there. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that might be interesting. Yeah, if we had the possibility, that would definitely be interesting to look into. Yeah. 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 Thank you. A lot, Dr. Hausfeld, and pass on to last but not least, Dr. Huber, also from Maastricht University. Thank you. Dear candidate, I want to start by congratulating you on this very nice piece of work and also to your supervisors and co supervisors joining online. It's really an impressive piece of work. It was a pleasure to read it. Um, I'm mostly excited about uh, the lay fMRI part. Um, Maybe also because I was a participant there, and there I witnessed your like high scientific um, quality standards there. Um, I'm specifically referring to how much you controlled the task. Right, there was a pre-session. You had to um, adjust the difficulty level about like you adjusted the loudness across pitch and the pitches. And then in the scanner, I didn't do very well, so I had to come back. Like, which is evidence for your highest scientific standards, and you really wanted to get the best data out of it. But are you subject number eight then? <laughs> no, I, I'm the, the, the long one. I think seven or so. Uh, but, <laughs> um, maybe my question refers to the valorization, um, where you have this very nice metaphor saying that people learned how to fly before, before the laws of aerodynamics were really understood. So people used it before they understood why it works. And I sometimes feel in layer fMRI, we are there. And um, as you point out, there needs to be this kind of um, interaction and the iteration between theory and applications. So now you have, a, like you really pushed on the application side, I think there, um, and used a relatively high level cognitive task already compared to other layer fMRI studies. So I'm asking you, what do you think, where does the layer fMRI field needs to go? Should we? go now back in this um, iteration and figure out better methods, better understand what the signal actually means, neurovascular coupling and um, understanding mechanisms and so on, or should we push rather further in, in the same direction and even use more high level cognitive tasks, maybe going to speech in those directions, what's necessary now? Highly esteemed opponents, thank you for your compliments and your question. And um, as I'm also pointing out in the impact chapter, I think that it's bidirectional and both is necessary. So um, we need the MR physicists that uh, work on the hardware and also the, the analysis and improving. So in, in better understanding, what are we actually measuring there? So gradient equivalent is the, the workhorse and we are, we are using this in many, um, studies that's not the only one for neuroscient more neuroscientific application studies but the one that is most often used and um it would be good if we further push on this and further and develop better models and understand the neurovascular coupling better on the one side but i also think that we are at a very exciting point in in pushing for more neuroscientific 
uh, application studies. And I mean, I'm not an MR physicist, and I am happy that I was able to to do this um, very method, uh, well, involved uh, research question and answer neuroscientific or ask neuroscientific questions. And I would like that this also that there are more advanced questions that we can ask. And I think it will be possible, like um, Emily Finn's study, for instance, where we are moving away from the primary areas and, and going to, to areas that have not been uh, looked into also with, for instance, more animal research, but then really go to, to speech and uh, other complex stimuli. And I think we are at a point where we're moving in this direction as well. So both is necessary, yeah. I have time for another one, do I? Um, maybe I can then ask more specifically about the letter. Like you said, that you use really high level top of the shelf methods now, and which is even applied to like with the Finn study in, in like frontal areas. Though you also mentioned to like Lars, I think that layer fMRI is hard, it, it's time consuming. And I particularly like your translation there of um, Herschel's work. Made, um, which was important in helping the analysis and the methods in the sense that um, for lay fMRI, one needs to really know where to extract the signal from. Like the RI selection is critical, right? Not only um, a lot of manual um, corrections of the segmentation is necessary, but also laterally, like which patch of the cortex should I take the, the signal from, where you use the Herschel's work and anatomical landmarks to really um, guide the RI selection. Not every brain area has a Herschel's work. So what do you think are the big roadblocks or the big um, developments that the fields need to do in order to make these kind of studies that you did scalable? Like um, imagine it's Christmas, what are the things that you wish to make this not only in 10 participants, but hundreds or, or thousands? What's, what's the thing that's holding us back? Yeah. Um, if I can wish yes, it's Christmas, <laughs> it's, um, there are certain, um, elements in the analysis that were very time consuming. And I think that would be the most limiting factor if you really wanted to scale it to a thousand participants. And, um, one of these was for instance, the, the segmentation work that was, um, manually done. So I would do, or as is done in standard practice, have an automatic segmentation to then be able to say where the gray matter and where the white matter is. And um, this automatic segmentation does a decent job, but then to be really able to say that what we're looking at here is the deep depth bin or the more superficial or middle, where I, I manually needed to draw, like if you're in paint for many, many hours to make sure that it's actually the right um, uh, segmentation at a, at a very high quality. And if we could reduce this, that would uh, that would be great. I mean, I got to listen to a lot of audiobooks during that time, but uh, yeah, so just the time factor there. And um, yeah, I think, um, so what else would be, so there was another part of your question that I- uh, I think I would agree that yeah. manual segmentation is the most time consuming thing. And that's holding us back in and, and yeah, yeah. Thank you very and much. And then also, I mean, the ROI selection in the end was also um, done uh, well, by manually drawing. So indeed, if there was an atlas that, um, so if we are not in primary regions, then we will need to benchmark and identify these regions. I mean, what we also did was use a functional localizer um, to identify not only, so Heschel's gyrus was either anatomically defined and then, um, uh, primary auditory cortex, which is on the medial portion on, of Hasher's gyrus, was then identified with a functional localizer. And if you can develop these type of localizers, let's say, for um, other regions, for more complex, uh, let's say, in frontal areas, you need to benchmark uh, like, and develop, see where in the depth you would be there. Yeah, if you if you need, you can finish your sentence, but it sounded pretty much yeah. finished. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, formerly uh, Miriam Heinkens, the time appointing, appointed, sorry, for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of the thesis in your defense. And I kindly ask you and the audience to await our return. We will come back for sure. <laughs>
I saw them. Me first. <laughs> <laughs> Miriam Heinzen, the degree committee here present has assessed your, uh, the quality of your thesis and your defense in view of its positive verdicts and taken into account your previous qualifications. The degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor uh, Pomisano is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with the Dutch university custom. And Elia, I kindly invite you to take the floor. First, there's a statement, right? Mm -hmm. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principle of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful, honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I promise. So, Yes, good. <laughs> but the authority vested in us by the law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Miriam Heinkes, the degree of doctor. I grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. So, Miriam, Dr. Heinkes, I first of all would like to really congratulate you and uh, your family and your friends and everybody that uh, I mean has been with you during this uh, this period. Um, I, I I mean I will leave most of the laudatio to Peter and uh, especially I mean I would like to also give you the best regard from Federico that is at home, right? I mean so the entire. Uh, a supervisor team has been really proud of what you have achieved and what you have done today. I, I mean, I, I can only remember this started uh, uh, quite some time ago. In the, I think it was like uh, in the, one of the last round of this MBO talent projects, right? But unfortunately, this does not exist anymore. But I mean, at that time, we could submit indeed a, a joint proposal between students and uh, professors, right? I mean, so. Uh, to, to, to get a PhD position and you were, you know, like good, very good to uh, to actually get this grant. I mean, I remember it was already quite some fun, uh, like uh, developing the project, right? I mean, especially, uh, I think I remember like uh, some distinctive uh, discussion between, uh, which has been the entire PhD defense <laughs> this period, I would say, the, the three of us, Peter, uh, Federico, me and you, right? I mean, especially, for example, I remember on the discussion on what is it exactly entrainment, right? I mean, so <laughs> this uh, uh, mysterious term that has been used and misused in all possible way. And, uh, you know, like, I mean, uh, so when starting to get into this uh, temporal uh, uh, aspects, right? I mean, so I think each one of us had a different definition of entrainment, which was kind of made for a fun uh, discussion. and. And also, I mean, what we we were uh, kind of uh, uh, saying in the uh, in the uh, room before in the discussion is we had COVID in between, right? So you, you had like these four years, and the two of these years they were with COVID uh, in between. And so actually, I mean, when I when I think to your work, I, I think about Zoom meetings, you know, like your weekly. <laughs> your, your weekly uh, meeting appearing there every every time very constantly there and I mean like and also uh, uh, thinking to the question that uh, Renzo was saying I think we spend like entire afternoon 
deciding what words I shall gyrus, right? I mean, so, and, and you know, like redrawing these lines, uh, you know, like online, uh, you know, like, I mean, to, to, uh, to uh, you know, like to, to make sense of, uh, of the anatomy, not, not the, I mean, not even the, the function, but just the anatomy of the thing. So, I, I mean, I, I, I will have really these uh, good memories with me of the scientific discussion. So the different scientific discussion that we had among us. And so the, 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 the way we work, which was mostly due to you, you know, triggering these meetings, you know, like, I mean, uh, preparing always this presentation every, every other week, every week there and a very, yeah, you should be really proud of what you achieved, you know, like, I mean, so it, it is in a very difficult circumstances you know, you will have to have a double seal there, you know, <laughs> like one for the regular PhD and the other with the, you know, COVID uh, 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 related the PhD. And with this, I would like to congratulate you and uh, everybody else, of course, and, uh, you know, give the words of, for, uh, uh, to Peter that will actually complete the laudatio. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, so also congratulations from from me, uh, again, in the name of the entire team, uh, and also, of course, um, Federico, who is not here. Um, and I, I would like to sort of join with uh, the memories about uh, the research master and how we uh, went into this, uh, into this project. Um, and um, I also, ex you know, I have Federico on the call, so you will also hear Federico's voice in what I'm going to tell you. Um, and um, yeah, so you were sort of interested in a lot of things at the same time, and and you were interested in audition, and and then this is why I said, you know, then then of course you should uh, work with uh, with with, with uh, Leah and, and Federico. But then they said, you know, that there's also a tension, so they said actually it should involve Peter. So you put us all together, and and we wrote this uh, grant together. And what was actually quite special, I verified this with Federico, is um, you can check whether what I remember is correct, but I don't think you were at the same time applying to many other uh, grants, right? So you were just there with us and you put all your money in this one grant, which actually meant that it had to work, right? So this also motivated us to do a really good job. And, you know, for once, you know, there was pay for effort and we got this grant and that was really the beginning of a very nice uh, uh, collaboration. So, um, okay, so I was thinking about what characterized your PhD. I think you were busy, right? <laughs> I think this is what we can say. So, of course, you were part uh, of two groups at the same time. Uh, you were part of Palm, um, and uh, you were part of the auditory group. And, of course, you came to all of the scientific meetings, you came to all of the social meetings. I remember that... Um, uh, speaking of COVID, uh, we were sitting in, um, where was it, in, in this um, on-campus cafe um, the day before COVID, and we sort of speculated that the jokes you made about COVID was actually the cause that COVID was actually happening in the, in the lockdown. And then as soon as that lockdown was over, we again saw each other uh, in the group, uh, sort of like re-starting re, uh, our uh, social um, get-togethers with the whole group. Um, Okay, that's one type of being busy. But you were also kept busy by three opinionated supervisors. This is also what Elia was referring to. So, and I think perhaps in the beginning, um, these very busy meetings with people that were very opinionated um, could have been a bit confusing, but you quickly managed to bring these discussions sort of in order and distilled then sort of a set of analysis to be done and you then did them, and as Ilya said, you reported on them, and you sort of like brought us back to order. Um, I think on a few occasions, um, yeah, the um, yeah taking all of these ideas in, in into account and doing this uh, analysis might also have been annoying, right? So I remember that um, on some occasions. Also, some I guess sometimes to please us, you sort of like did all the analysis that we suggested to then conclude that none of it actually turned out to be very necessary. <laughs> at, the same, at the same time, then I think you also sort of understood that doing this very broad exploration of the data actually increases the strength of your conclusions. So I think um, that was also uh, quite clear. 
another way in which we kept you busy was during the paper writing, right? So both the fMRI paper, the behavioral papers, and I will just relay an experience from my own uh, point of view. I remember a version of the second psychophysics paper where you send me the paper attached to a very happy email, basically saying, I'm very happy, we're done. And I read the paper and I thought, no, we're not done. And <laughs> I sort of like had lots of details on the, on the language. And then I actually thought the figures could be improved. And then I thought actually there could be also some more analysis. And then I sent you the whole thing. And then I asked, hmm, how is Miriam going to take this? And I got an email back. Um, let me see. I got the following response. Thanks for the elaborate feedback. I am working on it. <laughs> and this is really nice because in the past, you know, all of this feedback sometimes would have put you a little bit in doubt whether you would really, you, you know, you sometimes said that, you know, am I might cut off the right wood? And this email response and also many signs of how we were working together in the last one or two years um, showed that you completely out of this and i think with good reasons because you are simply an excellent researcher and um, a researcher with let's say broadly applicable skills which uh, was noticed by uh, a particular small company in amsterdam deloitte consultancy company in amsterdam where you now a consultant so i think we should also congratulate you with that not only a phd but already a job and now you might think I said everything, but I'm only halfway. I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> because there are so many things that there are to be said about about um, Miriam. So you also referred to this, and it was also referred to by um, some of the from some of your like uh, you know, by the opposition, let's say. Um, so they really liked the fact that you translated this very old German text from 1878 from the hand of um, Eschel about the auditory cortex. And well, very important background information, Federico, me, Elia, we don't speak German, okay? Now I will quote an email from Miriam. Miriam in an almost apologetic email wrote, since it is a German translation, I find it an ambiguous situation, however, I would be very happy to include you as a co-author, <laughs> which we, of course, declined because we had nothing to do with this. And we wanted, uh, of course, we were very happy for Miriam to take full credit. But I'm telling you this story because it actually shows how attentive and inclusive Miriam is. And so even though this was a sort of a funny event, but it was also a very nice event. I will very briefly mention also that you were a tutor in perception and attention. We spent a lot of time together and I can only say that it was really a pleasure to teach this course with you. And altruistic as you are, you wrote down all your accumulated teaching experience in a manual <laughs> for the benefit of tutor, uh, uh, future tutors. Um, it shows in everything I said so far, but Miriam really cares about people. And one, place, I think, or one, one organization where this really uh, was very clear is your, I think, two weekly organization of uh, vegan dinners, which grew uh, in, into quite some events. Um, and I think this is a very valuable initiative, but there is one outstanding question that remains to be resolved. Miriam claims that she can turn any dish into a vegan equivalent that tastes uh, at least as good. Oh, did I claim that? <laughs> so Federico told me that he disagrees and that he don't he doesn't think that, um, for example, the fantastic mozzarella cheese or Parmesan cheese can be matched by anything vegan. So this is a very important open question of your of your PhD that remains to be resolved. Okay. I also want to say on a more serious note, Miriam really cares deeply about her family. I felt this when you talked about your family. I felt this when um, when your, your mother was ill. Uh, and I felt this also in many other more upbeat things, like for example, how you decided to take one of your brothers as a sort of introduction 
to Thailand as a sort of introduction to Asian travel. I don't, I, I don't, I don't see your brother, but um, so these are, this also shows how much of a family person you are. And just along the same, same lines, you are also a very dedicated friend. Always nice, always ready to help. She helped really many people, and I think uh, many of you can uh, sort of agree with this. You helped many people feeling welcome at CN, solving problems and so forth. And during your defense preparations, um, you know, when you really had other things to do, Federico actually told me that you still managed to buy a present and bring it to them, and they really were touched by that. And just one random other thing, when I was diagnosed with COVID, question mark anyway, but I managed to not take my plane. You felt so sorry for me that you sent me a nice bottle of wine, so for consolation. And so, so many people have been touched by uh, various signs of kindness of you. And I, I, I think everybody um, appreciates this and is going to miss this. I also want to say you are, generally speaking, an extremely multi-talented person, right? You're, I, won't, I won't elaborate because then we read till tomorrow, but you are extremely cultured and well-read. I am impressed when I happen to get into conversations that um, tap into your cultural background. You also know what's important for yourself. So when you felt it was time, you know, to be in a new environment, you just took your stuff, went to Amsterdam and continued to work on your PhD there. It's it's nice that you can be, you can feel what you need, you're deciding and you do it and you feel good about it. Another talent, you have athletic cycling talents. And as you know, this is one of the things I also remember a lot in people. During a climb on the Kauberg, you know, if you're a little bit into cycling, you know it's one of the signature hills here in the, in the Netherlands. I was on a bike ride with you and Milena and maybe somebody else, and I started and I suffered. And then there was, Miriam, you know, like like a spear up to the top of the mountain, and we just saw it back at the top. And um, yeah, I think you have a future as a professional cyclist, if you will. <laughs> but I guess first you're going to be a consultant at Deloitte for a while. And um, yeah, I just want to wish you uh, all the best with uh, everything that you're going to do. So in the name again of our entire team, uh, Federico, Elia. Um, I want to congratulate you, your family, and um, with everything you accomplished and your PhD title again, of course, and enjoy this day. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Also on behalf of the rector and our dean, congratulations. We are all very, very proud of you. Uh, um, I hereby formally close this academic session and thanking all the people um, creating it, uh, including the people from far abroad online. Thanks for being with us. Also the people here. Uh, we would like to have a short photo moment here in front of the flowers. Then all